So let me just say in just, just the, the sort of the, the simplest way what I want to um, share. Um, so racism is alive and kicking. Um, racism is all around us. It's on the news. It's in our lives. What I want to talk about today is race as a function of power. So race is a function of power. And power is created through performances. Every moment is a choice. And we can choose to act deliberately, intentionally, or not. Okay? So that's the gist. Now you can like, go check your phones or do whatever you want to do. Let me flesh this out a little bit. So I graduated from a fancy university in London. Um, I'm actually wearing its colors. And when I came back to the United States, I was, I was, sort, of, I was sort of thinking that I knew everything about world history. Basically, I studied history and anthropology and political economy. And a friend of mine, Cecilia Salvatierra, uh, introduced me to a book. Um, that book was by Ivan Van Sertema uh, called They Came Before Columbus. And the basic thesis in that book is that there were pre-Columbian contacts in the Americas from Africa. So before Columbus, pre-Columbian, there were contacts of Africans coming to America. My response immediately to that was like, what? What are you talking about? I mean, there were like maybe some Vikings in the year 1000, you know, Leif Erikson or whatever, but Africans? No way. And mind you, I studied African history, right? I studied African diaspora history, and I just found it inconceivable. Because hmm? I've been trained to look at things in a particular way. And so I began a journey of exploration, and it took me back to West Africa, where I had been I'd done some ethnographic work with an anthropologist named Maxwell Owusu from the University of Michigan. And I started to look at this history, which is utterly fascinating. And one of the great figures was this um, emperor named Mansa Musa. And he was the emperor of the Mali Empire. There's this fascinating account of him taking his whole entourage. I mean, it's a whole village, a whole town, a whole city of 60,000 people on a pilgrimage to Mecca. And on the way back through Cairo, there was so much gold that was distributed in the economy that the price of gold had plummeted for 12 years, right? And so I was interested in studying some of these historical figures. And this is a little close-up image of him right here, Mansa Musa. And it introduced me to a whole body of literature that roughly is called sort of Afrocentrism. And Afrocentrism basically states that Africa is the fount of all great things, of all great civilizations. And, you know, one could make the case for that, absolutely. I mean, Africa produced us as human beings. It's produced all kinds of things in terms of technologies, philosophies, art, music, culture, languages, etc. There are over 1,200 distinct languages in sub-Saharan Africa, right? We're most diverse within Africa. And one of the things that Ivan Van Sertema talked about was these Olmec heads, and these Olmec heads were supposedly of African influence. And Mansa Musa was somebody whose brother had gone off on a voyage to find out if there was a, a Western uh, path to somewhere else and may have come across the Americas. And these stories were sort of interesting and floating around in sort of Afrocentric literature. And as I began to explore this, I began to see that there was a kind of essentialism that was being taught, that in some ways, it was a shift away from Eurocentrism, which basically says that Europe is the center of all great things and civilizations, and replacing it with a Afrocentric essentialism, right? As if nothing negative comes out of Africa, when of course negative and positive things come out of different parts of the world. And it was at this time, and as I was exploring this stuff, that I was also introduced to something completely different outside of my field, which was the work of an early Russian psychologist named Lev Vygotsky. Lev Vygotsky, next to the Olmec head there, was somebody who is very important in education and developmental psychology and understanding how languages are learned at the earliest stages. 
And let me perform this for you for a second. So for Vygotsky, how people learn language is by having somebody who's linguistically more developed relating to somebody who's less developed ahead of themselves. So, little Bobby. Ah. Now, little Bobby is trying to grab that milk bottle over there. Uh, milk bottle? Uh, bottle? Now, this is an extraordinary thing. His older sister, Susie, says, Bobby, you want that, that bottle of milk there? You want that, that bottle of milk? Now, this is a revolutionary thing that's happening. What's happening is that Susie is relating to Bobby as if he can speak. Hmm? As if he is, as Vygotsky says, a head taller than he is. It's by virtue of that relationship, of her relating to him ahead of himself, and him sort of babbling his way into language, that we learn language. And we do this all over the world, in all the different languages that we speak. We do it naturally. Now, one of the people who I learned Vygotsky through was a developmental psychologist, Lois Holtzman whose colleague, Dr. Lenora Filani, has been instrumental in a number of programs that take some of these ideas into the community to produce developmental approaches to learning and education. And so what Holtzman was talking about, who's on the left, was that this activity of relating to people ahead of themselves is something that we could do throughout our lives. It's not just about learning language, but it's about development throughout our lives. At a certain point, we're told, right? Stop playing, get serious, work, right? And we're sort of confined into these roles in society. And Vygotsky's insights on linguistic development are very important in terms of development for all of us. Because what, the, what, what Holtzman is saying is that we can perform, we can perform our own development, okay? So, what I've been doing for the last 20 years or so is trying to put some of these ideas into practice. Well, not putting, I mean, not trying. I have been putting with many colleagues here in North Carolina and other parts of the country and playing with this idea of development. I've been doing it by bringing students, faculty, and staff at my, my institution, which is down the road in Greensboro, and creating spaces where people can improvise, can play, can perform. Because power, to go back to what I earlier said, is something that is created through performances. When we talk about these demonstrations, right, when we talk about the civil rights movement, we talk about the abolitionists earlier, when we talk about black lives today, these are unnatural performances. People are breaking out of what they're supposed to do and doing something different. This is true at the level of social movements, at the, at the level of individuals. So we're developing and cultivating spaces where people can self-consciously think about performing as a powerful act of development. So I do this in my classes. I support my colleagues to do this. I do this in the hallways. I do this on stages. I do this at home. I'm fortunate to have two little kids, seven and eight years old, who teach me how little people are constantly playing and how we can learn from them to just kind of embrace play and go with it and how powerful that is. There we are performing together. And there we are doing a little demonstration. This was in response to what was going on in, in Mizzou. And hundreds of students came together in protest as they did all over North Carolina and all over the country, here at Chapel Hill included. We're doing this with the police. We're doing this performing of new kinds of relationships using the power of improvisation and play. We play little theater games. Right here we're playing this game called Family, Family Album, where basically people come into a stage for four seconds and have to pose into an emotion. And I do this with incredible results. Within seconds, people are kind of laughing, they're throwing themselves on the floor, they're doing all kinds of things. Now, why is this important? It's important because if we go with what is natural, the ways that we're socially trained to behave, there's only so much development that can take place. It requires an unnatural act. It requires a kind of pretending, performing, playing in order for us to develop. 
And there's a power in performing with others because you start to think of the unit of development not as yourself, the individual, but the group, the ensemble. Coaches know that if you're going to teach you know, your team to get better, you have to support the team, not just individual players. That individual players develop as a result of being in the team. So we're doing this down the street. We're doing this in different pockets of the country. And I, and I urge that we think about power as a function of, uh, uh, as race as a function of power. And that race, we know, is not a genetic, you know, genetically based or a biological category, but a social construction, but fundamentally about power. And power is created by people doing things that are a little unnatural, a little uncomfortable. We've all had that experience of stretching, whether we've been to a new country or a new town or a new place, and kind of learning how to perform in that new space. So it's by the power of performance that I believe that we can engage these issues that, that are critical to this country of, quote, race relations. So what I have to say is what I said at the beginning. Race is a function of power. Power is created through performances. Every moment is a choice. We can choose to act deliberately, intentionally, or not. So I ask you, what is your performance? What is our performance? How can we become more powerful? Thank you.